So this video is my Stages of Labor series where I'm going to walk you through the five phases of labor and birth. And this is something close to my heart and something that I put together when I was pregnant with my first daughter, mainly so that I could overcome the fear of the unknown, especially being a first time mom, and so that I would know what to expect, so that I could empower myself with knowledge, so that I could ultimately promote an easier birth for myself. And my wish for every mom is to enjoy a fearless birth no matter what birth they choose. And so I wanted to share this info with you guys. Okay, so let's go over the stages of labor. How many stages? There are three stages of labor. So stage one is the bulk of it. It includes the early labor phase, the active labor phase, and transition. Stage two is all about pushing phase. Stage three is the afterbirth of the placenta. So the early labor stage is the majority of the whole birth experience. It is known for its regular contractions that may not be close together and they may not last very long. And this is definitely said to be the most comfortable phase of labor as it is easing the body into the next phase of labor. So the signs of early labor include early labor contractions that may be five to seven minutes apart or they may be 10 minutes apart, lasting 30 to 45 seconds each. And they can even be sporadic at times. Mom is generally able to walk and rest and sleep and talk and laugh and move around with no problem. And the dilation of the cervix is somewhere in between zero centimeters to about six centimeters, with a goal of getting to 10 centimeters, the size of a bagel. So now we're gonna go into a little bit more in depth about early labor and share with you the extra signs that are happening. So with the true labor contractions that you should be having, these contractions wrap around from back to front. A big early labor sign is having loose stools. This is from the hormones relaxing the muscles around the rectum. And the body at this time usually does a good job of clearing itself out so that you can be ready to go. Also a big one in early labor phase that everyone wants to know about is the mucus plug or the bloody show. So the mucus plug is a cork-like barrier in the cervix that helps prevent bacteria from traveling up into the uterus. It is like an egg white jam consistency that can be lost in small pieces. This can happen days and even weeks before birth starts and therefore not a good indicator that labor will start soon since it has the ability to regenerate itself. But when you are having true early labor contractions and the cervix begins to thin and soften and open up, often a bloody mucus is expelled from the body. And that's where it gets its term, the bloody show. And in early labor, this is basically just a blood tinged mucus plug. So a little different, but it does mean that there's cervical change. So this bleeding we're talking about is caused by the rupture of small blood vessels in the cervix from a lot of pressure being placed onto the cervix, either by your baby's bottom or head. So the bloody show normally happens during labor for the most part, but can happen before, but most first time moms don't have much of a bloody show until active labor begins. So some recommendations on what to do in the early labor phase that you and your partner or your birthing team can be doing to just kind of make it flow better um, and just be easier on your body is definitely to rest and relax. You're going to want to stay put, stay comfortable, and it is really encouraged to do things that you love and enjoy and that just bring peace. And definitely get excited at this point. This is an exciting time. And I highly recommend to not obsess over tracking these contractions. For one, early labor can last a long time, even up to 20 hours for the first time mom. And two, during this early labor phase, you want your main focus to be on conserving energy and promoting labor hormones with feelings of love, comfort, and peace. So next, let's talk about those labor hormones or what you can do to promote an easier early labor. The number one recommendation that I was told is to not go to the hospital 
too early or the, your place of birth. There are definitely benefits to staying at home during this phase. It gives you the flexibility to move freely. If you're staying at home, you're more than likely being surrounded by people you trust and love and who make you feel completely comfortable. Or maybe you're kind of just going off to yourself and you don't want anyone at all to be watching you during this time. And that brings me to another good tip, which is to dim the lights. You can use a nightlight or LED candles. This signals to the brain that it is time for rest. And one of the hormones that is produced during this time is melatonin, which majorly promotes relaxation and sleep. Dimming the lights can also give you just a little less exposed feeling, which definitely can bring more comfort to the laboring mom. So yes, taking a nap during this time would definitely be beneficial for conserving energy. Making sure to speak softly and have others around you speaking softly to you. You could even put on some soft labor music definitely to keep the peace that your relaxing labor hormones are trying so hard to work up. It's important to get comfortable and comfortable clothes even under warm blankets. Again, comfort is everything during this phase. Another good one is cuddling and kissing. This boosts that love oxytocin hormone responsible for all those labor contractions you're having and about to have. Another thing that would be fun to do is watch like a love movie, a love relaxing movie. You don't wanna watch anything intense or something that would cause you to have anxiety or anything like that. But it ultimately would be best if you stayed away from electronics and blue light. Again, to keep boosting that melatonin and boosting that love oxytocin hormone. So all of that promotes that important parasympathetic calming body system and all those good labor hormones that your body needs for a quick and easy labor rather than ramping you up and putting yourself in fight or flight mode or your sympathetic stressed body system which unfortunately can cause more pain putting yourself into fear and therefore causing more pain and can even stall labor or cause it to be longer than it should be. So let's not do that. In this early labor phase, you're gonna definitely want to get prepared, making sure to eat a nourishing meal and keeping hydrated as you approach the active labor phase. And as you get closer into that active labor phase, gonna want to just stick to like the energizing liquid since your digestive system slows down once you get deeper into labor. Another great thing to do to prepare is visualize. Just getting in a comfortable position and positively imagining your birth and labor experience happening exactly as you planned or at least in a positive way. It would be a good time to say a prayer, read over your birth affirmations, and remind yourself of your birth motto that you're wanting to hang on to during your labor and birth. And if you are not wanting to have a home birth, you're gonna wanna finish packing really quick and get ready for the day, put your car seat in the car, all those things, those last minute things that you're needing to get done. If you're feeling a little uncomfortable during this phase, some good things to do would be a light, gentle labor massage, making sure to go up and away from the spine. But I would love to go into more detail with that topic in another video. You could also try a heating pad or a shower where it's targeting on a certain area that you're feeling uncomfortable. It's not recommended to take a bath during this phase. A bath could really slow down labor during this early labor phase since this is already a long process and in a good way to prepare your body. As things get a little more intense and you are slowly moving into that next active labor phase, you wanna go ahead and get into the habit or the ritual of using your breathing techniques. Even though you may not need them for pain management right now, it's good to get in that flow ahead of time before it catches you off guard. De-stress breathing and mindful breathing techniques are so beneficial for having an easier labor and birth. 
So the active labor phase is much more predictable with longer, more intense contractions that are closer together. The body starts to move into more hormonal shiftings and changes. And this is definitely a phase where relaxation and concentration techniques are needed and the birth partner's role becomes way more prominent. So let's go into detail about the active labor signs. Contractions are three to five minutes apart, and the contractions are very predictable, lasting 60 seconds each. Dilation is usually from six centimeters to eight to nine centimeters, which is from the size of a cookie headed to a bagel. Mom at this point is usually able to relax, but is really having to focus on each contraction wave. Women describe it as catching them off guard and having to stop what they are doing to really cope and manage through those contraction sensations. This right here is a huge indicator that you are in active labor and a big sign that it could probably be time to go to the hospital or your place of birth. So some extra active labor signs that you may experience is pink spotting or bleeding. This is again caused by the rupture of small blood vessels in the cervix from lots of pressure being pressed on it. You may start to get a little emotional, usually from the ramp up of all the hormones or even just the discomfort itself. Another sign is that the body starts to clear out due to the hormones loosening up the pelvic muscles to prepare the body for birth and to make room for the baby to move deeper into the pelvis without anything getting in the way. So you may experience some diarrhea and the need to empty your bladder. You may also see some non nausea and vomiting. The digestion process at this point typically stops working deeper into labor. So if you go into labor with a full stomach, you might find yourself feeling really nauseous and the need to throw up, especially as labor progresses. This also could be due just to all the hormone shifts or from the intensity of the labor contractions themselves. But you may experience more nausea if you've received an epidural because it can cause a drop in blood pressure, which causes nausea. You could even experience a hot or cold, sweaty feeling, which is just a sign that things are moving right along and you're either right at the transition phase which is the next phase of labor, or getting super close to it. Another common thing that may happen during active labor is your water breaks, but it's common for it to stay intact longer. This occurs usually just from all the pressure or from the enzymes breaking down the amniotic sac. So what should you do to promote an easier active labor phase? As mentioned before, it might be a good time to go to the hospital, especially though if you're wanting to receive an epidural because different hospitals have different protocols on when their time limit is for giving one. You could also use some pump up music, especially on the drive down to the hospital, which is distracting in a good way and also brings a lot of inspiration when you're really needing it. It also may be recommended to hydrate and possibly eat energizing liquid snacks. So what if you are wanting to speed up labor and speed up the active labor phase? My number one tip would be to use engaging techniques. These techniques help engage the baby's head and get them deeper and lower into the pelvis. Sitting in a hospital bed generally keeps you in a butt tucking position and makes it much harder for the baby to descend down, making labor more rigid and longer than it should be. So if you're looking to speed things up, walking with free swing thighs is recommended, doing deep squats like in a mid-eastern stance, or doing figure eights like a salsa dance on your exercise ball. So number two, stay upright. So deeper into labor, you're not going to be able to do the big baby mama dance and squats, especially as things get more intense. But I want to encourage you to be brave and keep moving positions. And the least you could do is just stay upright to keep working with gravity. You will not want to at this point, but it is going to be so beneficial to your labor and speeding it up and not waste any time with those contractions. Some great options for upright positions are sitting on the edge of the bed, sitting on an exercise ball with your booty untucked, standing and leaning into your partner, bed, table, or walls, or leaning 
standing over a ball in the hands and knees position, also known as kneeling. You could try toilet sitting or using a squat chair, and also squatting in the bath is great too. If you're feeling major discomfort, there are tools you can use to help relieve this. If you're seeing lots of irregular contractions or hard or stalled or lots of back labor, you may want to ask yourself what the baby's positioning is. It's best to have your baby in the most optimal birthing position before labor starts, but things can be unpredictable and babies can spin around and move around whenever they want to and can definitely play a role in all that back labor and stalled labor you could be having. Also, lots of sunny side up babies tend to give you lots of hard back labor. So you'll definitely want the tricks to spin that baby around even in active labor. Another thing you could do is use the shower head to target specific areas or get into the warm tub. Warm water seems to have almost magical powers at relieving pains during labor. You could also have your partner be doing labor massages, counter pressure, or pressure points. Massaging techniques are huge for promoting an easier labor and working through pain management, which I would love to talk to you more about in another video. So the transition phase is right after the active labor phase and is the last phase of the first stage of labor. It ends just before the second stage of labor, which is the pushing phase. The transition phase is by far the most challenging and most intense part of labor, although it is the shortest phase. Plus, there is a time distortion from all the body's natural endorphins, which definitely helps time pass more quickly. And these endorphins actually make it difficult for the mother to remember clearly right after birth. These contractions finish dilating the cervix, so baby is all ready for the second stage of labor and to then move down the birth canal. It is thought to be the mother's breaking point, the point where she transitions from woman to mother. The strong sensations might falter the mother's focus, so mindful breathing techniques and encouragement is required. During this phase, women usually go inward and are extremely vulnerable to suggestions at this time, which can definitely hinder the birth experience if poor advice is given. So let's talk about what does labor pain feel like? For most, the biggest fear in birth is pain. But what most people don't know is that this pain we fear is connected to emotional feelings such as dread and agony. So it's super important to distinguish what labor and birth pain actually is. Birth has transformative pain sensations. Much like a teething baby or childhood growing pains. It's in fact pain signaling transformation and not a pain that is signaling that something is wrong, which is the pain we most fear. For example, deep in my own labor, I started to feel these strong menstrual light cramping and I really started to begin to fear, but I was mindful of these sensations and immediately stopped my fear thought and I reminded myself that these are good sensations and they are bringing me closer to my baby and that I was safe. It was a way for me to stay in control and stay in the present, but at the exact same time, embrace the sensations that were happening and being okay with the birthing sensations mindfully and letting it be. I would like to point out that whatever birth you choose or whatever ends up being your birth experience, informing yourself on the physical aspects of labor and birth empowers you to know what can be normal and expected and therefore eliminating so much fear. But first, we must rewire our thoughts about birth in order to birth fearlessly. And then we must learn how to change how we respond and how we will relate and experience the physical pains of labor differently. That way we can be with the sensations of labor as they are, knowing they are transformative and good. If you didn't know, there are four types of pain and three of them that we must overcome to fully understand pain as it pertains to labor and delivery. Number one, there's transformative pain, safe pain that is signaling transformation like in labor. There is emotional pain, how we feel about that pain. And there 
there's cognitive pain, what we think about the pain, and last but not least, there is physical pain. The true pain that is beneficial to our well-being since it is harming us. Like the sharp pain of cutting your finger, or the deep dull pain of stubbing your toe, or even the feeling of burning your hand on the stove. And out of all the terrible words, cognitive and emotional, that are used to describe pain and labor, such as death, fear, agony, and dread, the only non-cognitive, non-emotional, real true pain sensations experienced in birth come down to these five sensations. Cramping, stretching, tightening, burning, and pressure, but they're all transformative physical pain. And those don't sound so bad, you got this. Plus, if we stay present, stay mindful, and stay fearless because of all the labor endorphins being produced, which are similar to the pain relieving effects of morphine and heroin, we experience a euphoric peace and rest in between each contraction. And you could totally handle that. Also, since labor pain is transformative pain and not the instinctual physical pain that we fear, it would be a good idea to probably name it something else, like labor sensations, to disassociate from the emotional and cognitive perception that we already have of pain. So I encourage you to call it and think of it as labor sensations throughout your pregnancy and labor as a tool to reprogram your negative perceptions about birth and to eliminate fear. All right, now that we got that out of the way, let's go over the transition phase of labor signs to further delete the fear by knowing exactly what to expect. Contractions are one to three minutes apart and they feel just like strong menstrual cramps, lasting 90 to 120 seconds each. Contractions increase when changing positions and they may even double peak without break. Dilation is usually from 8 to 10 centimeters, like an orange growing to a bagel, and mom at this time typically can't find a comfortable position to make things lighter. But generally, this phase only lasts 30 minutes to 2 hours. And also, an undisturbed, unmedicated birth will usually have a hormonal time distortion that we talked about that will make things seem so much faster and even for the birth partner. Some extra signs of the transition phase, which are all showing fast transformative changes, usually due to large hormonal shifts. You may have a hot sweaty feeling and a cold rag on your head and neck feels really nice at this time. My labor and delivery nurse knew right when to put it on and it helped so much. You may experience cold and involuntary but painless shakiness. You may experience nausea and vomiting. You may experience heavy breathing, grogginess or mental fog. It's common for your water to break at this time. You may be afraid to move. Mom is looking for a way out. Remember, this is her breaking point right now. And mom may be getting super discouraged at this time. So what to do to promote an easier transition phase? As mentioned before, mom usually goes really inward and there's not usually talking at this time or exchanging of conversations. So it would be good to remind your birthing team, your birthing partner ahead of time to remind you of these things. A good reminder would be to slow down your breathing and to focus on one contraction at a time. Another great reminder or to do is to relax your body. Reminders to relax your pelvis, relax your jaw, because a tense jaw is a tensed pelvis. It's amazing how our bodies are all interconnected. But remember, the labor sensations are only in your abdomen, so there's no reason to cause tension in other parts of your body and waste energy. The way more beneficial to utilize that energy for strength 
elsewhere, like your uterus. Sometimes it is nice to tense your hands by holding someone's hand really tight to just kind of balance those sensations. This would be a good time to alert your birthing team in some way because they may need time to set up things, set up the room, but it's not time to push yet. At this time, mom may want to look for a resting position to already be ready for the pushing phase and to conserve energy. I know I immediately needed to lay down and lay down on my side, but some other great options would be getting in the hands and knees position, kneeling or leaning over a bed or a ball, maybe time to get in the tub if you're wanting to push in the tub. The birthing team at this time should not be asking any questions and should avoid small talk and should just know what the birthing mother needs at this time so that she can stay inward and it not be a distraction. Like when she's getting all sweaty, that should be cue for dad or your birth partner or your team to stick a cold rag on your forehead. She's breathing more heavily. Her mouth is probably dry. So your birth helper will need to know to bring you a glass of water. So if you're having trouble coping with pain at this point, there are some suggestions I have for you. Stating your birth motto in your head is going to help immensely. Or you could have your birth partners or helpers um, read those affirmations or mottos out loud to you. Since the mom is needing tons of encouragement at this time, hearing those positive declarations about herself is going to keep her inspired and in control and in the present. Another great tip is mindful breathing, which is extremely helpful with coping with the sensations of labor, keeping your mind in control while focusing on each breath. Some of my favorite are counting while breathing or scanning your body to stay in the present. Another great option that tons of mothers do is called sounding in low tones. Keeping low sounding tones like oohs and ahs instead of high pitched screams are super beneficial for staying relaxed. It is the most common sounds expressed during labor and can even signal to your care providers that you are relaxed and handling the sensations well. Or if you are yelling and screaming, this can be a sign to your care provider that you're holding tension probably somewhere else and probably needing extra coping skills and strategies to manage this phase. But a simple reminder to just use those low tones can make a super big impact, which I would love to go over in another video. Stage two has just one phase, the pushing phase. So this phase begins once full dilation has been reached and the cervix is no longer in front of the baby's head or bottom, so it can then easily travel down the birth canal. This stage is usually much more manageable than the other stages, since the contractions are a different sensation than the others previously. The body will naturally push involuntarily to expel the baby from the uterus. Letting your body guide with little to no conscious effort allows your body time to stretch during crowning. Ending the phase with the birth of the baby. So let's go over the signs of the pushing phase. Dilation is at a 10 centimeters. Contractions have a defined resting period, are usually three to five minutes apart, lasting 45 to 90 seconds each. And unlike before, no menstrual light cramping. This stage can last a few minutes to several hours. For unmedicated births and experienced mothers, this stage typically is shorter than in medicated births, but let me reassure you, it is is not a race. Mothers with epidurals may feel the urge to push. They may feel rectal or pelvic floor pressure or no sensation at all and may need to follow coached pushing by a care provider, dependent on the individual and the medication used. In some unmedicated births, the active pushing phase may be more accurately described as the fetal ejection reflex. The fetal ejection reflex or FER is the natural involuntary pushing mechanism that the body uses to 
eject baby out like a piston. Some extra signs of the pushing phase. Just before the FER, the fetal ejection reflex, contractions tend to ease up and decrease. And pushing like having a bowel movement is rarely required if you wait for this reflex to kick in. And it's so much more easier and gentler on the body to just breathe baby out when each powerful surge is felt, which we are also going to be talking about how to breathe baby out. During the late pushing stage, you tend to have a burst of renewed energy. This passive waiting phase of the second stage of labor is a time of rest, sometimes even called laboring down, as the baby rotates and descends down onto the pelvic floor. This passive phase sometimes happens after the mother is fully dilated and as she then waits for the urge to push. Next is crowning, which is the tingling, burning, stinging sensations felt as the baby's head or bottom emerges. Also known as the famous ring of fire. Also about to talk about that and how to best cope with that. Also, it is super common to see a little extra bleeding, minor bowel movements, and urination. Okay, let's talk about what to do about all these signs and sensations and how you can help prevent vaginal tearing. The main concern about this phase, right? And also just making this experience as easy and as short as possible. So number one to help prevent vaginal tearing is to stay hydrated. Just as your stretching belly needs extra moisture, so does your perineum. Number two is to push in lateral pushing positions. The three lateral pushing positions are pushing on your hands and knees, side lying and kneeling. They are excellent and great for preventing vaginal tearing. The number three tip to prevent vaginal tearing and to make this phase so much smoother is to wait for the fetal ejection reflex. Waiting for the fetal ejection reflex reduces stress, vaginal tearing, and keeps a great balance in hormones that allows for that birthing magical experience. The fetal ejection reflex is best felt when the mother feels fully safe, supported, and allowed to birth in peace. This reflex can be very rare to be seen or experienced in a birth filled with interventions, inductions, and medications, as those things do interfere with the natural birthing hormones. This is the only part of labor when the fight or flight mode is present and should be present only in this stage. This boost of adrenaline can make the mom seem unreasonable and emotional, but should be met with nothing but kind words and encouragement to keep laboring. If it is taking too long for the fetal ejection reflex to kick in, mom may need that boost of adrenaline to kickstart it. You may have to think of a scenario that you do not want to happen, like the possible need of using a vacuum or forceps or a transfer to the hospital or whatever would be disturbing to you and your birth. During the actual fetal ejection reflex, the contractions work to push baby down until finally a huge burst of oxytocin is released and then the baby is ejected out like a piston in just three to four strong contractions. Okay, so the fourth tip to reduce vaginal tearing and to make this so much more smoother is to do J breathing or breathing baby out. I asked a large group of ladies what they did to avoid zero vaginal tearing and it all came down to one common denominator and it was to breathe baby out. Breathing baby out is like pushing like you're blowing out a candle but in order to do this you must wait for the fetal ejection reflex. Like I said, true pushing, like you're having a bowel movement, is rarely required if you wait for this reflex to kick in. Okay, let's talk about the ring of fire. What is it and how can you cope with it? So the ring of fire is when the baby starts to emerge or crowns, there tends to be a burning or tingling sensation from the stretching or tearing of the perineum tissue. So before you start doing a ton of perineal massages, studies show that they're probably worthless. It may even cause a tiny micro tears and swelling and is super uncomfortable, distracting, and awkward. But a much better and easier option would be warm compresses. 
Warm compresses during crowning also feels nice and relieves some of that burning. But warm compresses have also been shown to help decrease the incidence of tearing. The standard protocol at out of hospital births is to use warm compresses on the perineum. The same techniques can be used for water births by providing firm support to the perineum with the hand, usually done by the mother herself. And my last tip to make this stage so much smoother and to prevent vaginal tearing is to relax and take your time. I encourage you to not force push when it really starts to burn. That's letting your body know that you need to take a step back for a second and allow your perineum to stretch with or without feeling the fetal ejection reflex. So you can at least do that and apply the perineum support when you feel like it or need it. Then relax and just guide baby out. Pushing or crowning can be a process of going one step forward and taking two steps back. So don't let that discourage you because it's most likely allowing more time for your perineum to stretch and decrease your risk of tearing. So definitely not a race to push baby out in however many minutes or hours. It's also important to wait a minute after the baby's head is out to then allow time for your perineum to stretch to then get the shoulders out. You also want to stay present and calm and want to remember this special moment. And just bring baby into the world peacefully. Being present is when you're at your most truest self, a very powerful state to be in, and also when you can remember the best. So we are about to go over the entire stage three of labor and stage three just includes one phase, which is the birth of the placenta or also known as afterbirth. The afterbirth stage is the final stage of labor and begins with the birth of your baby and ends with the birth of the placenta. At this time, the placenta will naturally detach from the uterine wall and be expelled through the birth canal. How this happens is under the influence of the hormone oxytocin, strong regular contractions work to decrease the size of the uterus, which helps shear the placenta away from the uterine wall. Skin to skin contact between you and your baby or your baby's first attempt at breastfeeding releases more of that good oxytocin, furthering the uterine contractions and therefore playing a huge role in the delivery of your placenta, while also preventing postpartum hemorrhage. The placenta delivery should never be rushed, nor should it be tugged on for health risk reasons, such as pelvic organ prolapse, cord snap, placental rupture, pieces of the placenta being left behind, and maternal hemorrhaging. This third stage is a time of reaping all the rewards of pregnancy and labor as the hormones of love and peace surround the room as you meet your new baby. So let's go over the signs of afterbirth or what to expect during this phase. The delivery of your placenta roughly happens about 20 minutes after birth or safely longer, but usually within the hour of the birth of your baby. You may experience some strong, crampy-like contractions as this is your body's natural way to shrink back your uterus especially while you're breastfeeding as the surge of oxytocin is present during this time. Some moms find it super hard to cope with these types of contractions after birth, especially if this is your second or third baby as that seems to be worse. You may experience a small gush of blood as your placenta separates or the lengthening of your umbilical cord as the placenta lowers down. Some extra signs that you may experience during this time is a strong rush of endorphins of love and peace. In combination with this, you may experience a lowering of your adrenaline hormone, and if not balanced with a warm, comforting environment, it can create a cold, shivering feeling for the mother and the baby. So let's go over what to do to create the most optimal birth experience and cover those big topics like delayed cord clamping, postpartum hemorrhage, and delayed infant bath together. Care providers all over are waiting to cut the cord until 
there is no pulse and it is completely white as long as the baby and mama are healthy and doing great. The American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology suggest waiting at least 30 to 60 seconds of delayed cord clamping. If you are doing delayed cord clamping, it is common for the placenta to be sat in a bowl next to mom and baby, especially in a physiological undisturbed birth. It is important to know how postpartum hemorrhage happens. Postpartum hemorrhage occurs after the placenta is out and can and does occur in C-section births as well. When a physiological unmedicated undisturbed birth does not take place, especially in a hospital setting, active management is needed to birth the placenta. So what to expect with active management of the placenta? An artificial version of oxytocin is given to initiate uterine contractions. Then the cord is usually clamped and cut, and sometimes the placenta is drained, and then usually pulled out, hopefully using controlled cord traction. It is super important that your care provider waits for there to be signs that the placenta has already detached, such as a trickle of blood and a lengthening of the umbilical cord. You can also accidentally start to detach it before the artificial oxytocin kicks in and then have no contractions there to stop the bleeding. You could also more commonly snap the umbilical cord and the care provider will usually have to grab the placenta out himself or a rare but worse scenario would be to actually pull the entire uterus out. So the idea of not tugging or pulling on the cord at all may be a good one. Non-epidural women should have the option of getting upright and pushing to get their placenta out safely. On the other hand, in a physiological, unmedicated, undisturbed delivery, a natural delivery of the placenta may be best. In an undisturbed setting, active management of the placenta was associated with a seven to eight fold increase in postpartum hemorrhage compared to the natural physiological approach. And in another study, women having undisturbed physiological births, active management actually increased their chances of having postpartum hemorrhage. Keep in mind that a safe and physiological placental birth requires effective endogenous oxytocin release. Okay, so now let's go over a few things that happen to mom and baby after birth. Newborn babies don't have the ability to control their temperature very well, so it's important to keep them warm and dry. It would be good to cover a mom and baby with a warm towel directly after birth. Skin to skin or kangaroo care is also a great thing to do after birth. Women who did not have skin to skin and breastfeeding directly after birth were almost twice as likely to have postpartum hemorrhage compared to women who did not have this contact with their baby. Also helping baby to keep keep warm and regulating their temperature. To ensure that this be done, you can suggest that all newborn procedures be done in your arms. As long as mom and baby are doing great, they can lightly wipe off, suction the mouth, check the heart, or whatever they need to do to make sure that mom and baby are doing great. If you are looking for the gentlest and most peaceful entry into the world for your little one, then weighing and measuring and regular newborn procedures should occur at least an hour after skin-to-skin -skin time and after the first attempt at breastfeeding. And most moms delayed about 24 hours for the PKU testing. It would also be great to delay your infant's first bath. In a study of almost 500 babies published in the Journal of Obstetric, Gynecologic, and neonatal nursing found that delaying a healthy newborn's bath for more than 12 hours after birth resulted in a greater rate of exclusive breastfeeding in the hospital and increased rates of mothers planning to breastfeed. The World Health Organization recommends delaying your infant's first bath at least up to six hours and ideally 24 hours after birth. 
baths can easily make them cold and physically stress them. The waxy whitish vernix that coats your baby's skin protects and moisturizes them while also keeping her warm. It may also help baby develop their microbiome, which is the gut bacterial flora, which researchers and experts think may play a role in future disease prevention. It would also be a great idea for mom and baby to take an herbal bath right after birth or whenever comfortable. Postpartum herbal baths soothe sore perineal or postpartum muscles and hemorrhoids, also slowing down bleeding and minimizing swelling while also creating a special bonding experience for mom and baby. If you birthed in a hospital, you'll probably stay for about 24 to 48 hours. If you have an uncomplicated C-section birth, you'll probably be in the hospital for about two to four days. If you have a birth center birth, if mom and baby are doing well, you're usually sent home about four to six hours after birth and the midwife usually comes to check on mom and baby the next day. Hopefully you have a better understanding of active labor signs, knowing exactly what to do, when to go to the hospital, and how to speed up labor. Well, that's all I have for you in this video. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.